A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens Part three, the second of the three spirits, awakening in the middle of prodigiously puffed snow, sitting up in bed to get his thoughts together, Scrooge had no occasion to be told that the bell was again upon the stroke of one. He felt that he was restored to consciousness in the right nick of time, for the special purpose of holding a conference with the second magistrate dispatched to him through Jacob Marley's intervention. But finally he turned and completely out cold, when he began to wonder which of his curtains was new. His new spectre would draw back. So he put every side, one aside with his own hands and lying down again, established a sharp lookout all around the bed. He wished to challenge the spirit on the moment of its appearance. He did not wish to be taken by surprise and made nervous. A gentleman of the easy, free and easy sort, Plum themselves, plume themselves of being acquainted with a move or two, being unusually equal to the time of day, expressed a wide range of the capacity for venture by observing that they are good for anything, from pitch to and toss to manslaughter, between which opposite extremities, no doubt, there lies a tolerable wide and contracted range of subjects, without venturing, varying, varying. The Scrooge quite as hardly as this. I don't mind calling on you to believe that he's already for a good broad field of strange appearances, and nothing but between a baby and a rhinoceros would astonish him so very much. Now, being prepared for almost everything, he was not by any means prepared for nothing. Constantly, the bell struck one, and a shape appeared, which was taken with a violent fit of trembling. For... Five minutes, ten minutes, a quarter of an hour went by, yet another, nothing came. All this time he lay upon his bed, a very cold centre, a blaze of ruddy light, which streamed upon it, and the clock proclaimed the hour, which, being not only light, was one more alarming than a dozen ghosts he had powers to make out what it meant, or would be at, or sometimes, or sometimes apprehensive what it might be, at the very moment, and it was in case of spontaneous combustion, without having the consolation of knowing it. At last, however, began to think, as you and I would have thought at first, for it always a person not a predicament who knows what ought to have been done in it, would unquestionably have done it too. At last, I say he began to think that source of secret is ghostly light, might be a joining room for whence or further tracing it, it seemed to shine, this idea taking full possession of his mind. So he got up slowly, softly, <coughs> shuffled on his slippers, his slippers to the door. The moment Scrooge's hand was on the lock, a strange voice called out to him by his name, bade him enter, he obeyed. It was his own room, there's no doubt about that, but it was undergone a surprising transformation. The walls of the city were so hung with living green, it looked a perfect grove, that every part of which bright, gleaming berries glistened, the crisp leaves of holly, mistletoe and ivy reflected back the light. So many little mirrors had been scattered there, such a mighty blade went roaring up the chimney, as that dull perforation of teeth had never known in Scrooge's time or Marley's, or for many and many winter seasons gone, heaped up on the floor to form a kind of throne, the turkeys, geese, game, poultry, brawn, great joints of meat, plucking pigs, long reefs of sausages, mint pie, throat, plum pudding, barrels of oysters, red hot chestnuts, cherry cheap apples, juicy oranges, luscious pears, immense twelve, cake, twelve cakes, and seeming peer bowls of punch made in a chamber dim with a delicious steam. 
in every state upon this couch there sat a jolly giant glorious to see who bore a glowing touch in shape not unlike pity's horn pity's horn held it up high high up to shed its light on scrooge he came down peeping around the court door come in this way with us come in are you know me better man scrooge entered timidly hung his head over all the spirit you're not the dogged spirit scrooge you've been and through the spirit's eye were clear and kind he did not like to meet them i am the ghost of christmas present said the spirit look upon me scrooge eventually did so he was clothed in one simple green robe or mantle bolded white fur his garment hung so loosely on the figure his capitious breast was bare his disdaining be welded or concealed upon any artifice his feet and miserable beneath the ample folds of garment also bare on its head it wore no other conveying covering than a holly wreath sat there with its hiding icicles its dark brown curls were long and free freeing as its genial face its barking eye his own open hands cheery voice his unconstrained demeanour and joyful air gilded around its middle with an antique scabbard but, but no sword in it each its sheath was eaten up with rust scrooge's third visitor you have never seen the likes of me before exclaimed spirit never scrooge made an answer it have never walked forth for the younger members of my fam family meaning that i am very young my older brother's born in these later years pursued the panther i don't think i have said scrooge i'm afraid i have not have you many brothers spirit more than eighteen hundred said the ghost turned to his family to fly for muttered scrooge ghost of, ghost of christmas present runs spirit said scrooge says miss lee conduct me where you like real i went forth last night on compulsion i learned a lesson which is working now tonight <coughs> if you want to teach me <coughs> you ought to teach me let me perfect my touch my robe goo did as he was told and held it fast holly mistletoe red berries ivy turkeys geese Game, poultry, brawl, fate, pigs, sausages, oysters, pies, puddings, fruit, and punch, all in this instantly. So did the room, the fire, the goodly road. The hour of night, he stood in city streets on Christmas morning, where, for the weather was severe, people made a rough but brisk, but unpleasant kind of music from scraping the snow, the pavement in front of their dwellings. From the tops of the houses went, and had delight to the boys to see it came pumming down to the road below, bedding into the artificial little snowstorms. House fronts looked black enough, the windows blacker, contrasting the white, smooth white sheet of snow upon the roots, the dirty snow upon the ground. The least deposit, last deposit had been piled up, the deep furrows by the heavy wheels of carts and wagons, furrows and crossed, recrossed each other, hundreds of times, where the great streets branched off, made intricate channels hard to trace in the thick yellow mud and icy water. The sky was gloomy and shortest streets were choked up with a dingy mist, half thawed, half frozen, whose heavier particles descended in shower of sooty atoms, as if all the chimneys in Great Britain had, in one cons consent, caught fire and when were blazing away, to a dear heart's content, and nothing very cheerful in the climate of the town, yet was there an air of cheerfulness, a bowl with which the clearest summer, clear, clearest summer of the air, brightest summer of air, I have endeavoured to fuse in vain. For the people who were just shoveling away in the hilltop, housetops of Jovel, full glee, calling out to one another, the parapets and now he was changing a fatuous snowball better, na better natured missile far than worthy a wordy jest laughing heartily if it went right and not less heartily if it went wrong 
poultry fruits, shoes, shops of thought, still half open. Lotus were radiant in their glory. A great round belt bedded baskets, chestnuts, shaped like waistcoats of jolly old gentlemen, lolling at the doors and tumbling out in the street. You had a pot of elliptic ambulance. A ruddy, brown faced, grilled, grafted Spanish onions shining in the flatness, a growth like furnished fires, winking from the shelves of wanton shyness of the girls went by and glanced and moodily hung up mistletoe. Her pears and apples clustered high. The blooming pyramids, her bunches of grapes made in the shopkeeper's benevolence to dangle from capricious hooks. Her fairies with mouths like water gracious as they pass. Her piles of filberry birds, mossy and brown, recalling the mouth, their fragrance, ancient walks among the forest woods, peasants shuffling ankle deep through the withered leaves. There was no, no foot bunted, buffins stropped and squaw, squawny, setting off the yellow of the oranges and lemons, the great comp- compactness of their juicy persons. I was entreating and beseeching to be carried home in paper bags, eaten after dinner. Very gold and silver fish set forth among these choice fruits in a bowl, through members of dull and stagnant worded race, Appear to know there was something going on, and the fish went round most thing round and round, a little world in slow and precious excitement. The grocers, oh, the grocers nearly closed with perhaps two shutters down, or one, although they got such those got such glimpses, not alone the scales descending on the counter made a merry sound, and white twine and roller putty company so briskly. While the canisters were rattled up and down like royal juggling tricks, even a blended sense of tea and coffee, so grateful to the nose, even the razor was so plentiful, rare, almonds so streamy white, with sticks of cinnamon so long and straight, and other spices so delicious, canned fruits so caked and spotted, with malted sugar and to make coldest bonlookers on feel faint and subsequently bellious. Nor was it that the figs were moist and plump. Or the French plums blushed in most tiredness, they had highly decorated butch boxes, as something everything was good to eat in its Christmas dress. The customers were not all so hurried and so eager, hopeful promise of the day. They tumbled up against each other at the door, crushing their wicked baskets wildly, and left their purchases upon the counter, and came running back to fetch them, committed hundreds of little mistakes in best humour possible. A gross of these people were so frank and fresh, the polished hearts with which they fastened their aprons, trying to make them be in their own, torn outside for general inspection. On Christmas drew at girls, the peck at if they choose. But soon the steepness but soon the steeples called good people to all the church and chapel away they came flocking through the streets in their best clothes and their gayest faces. Same time we emerged from scores of by streets, lanes and nameless turnings, innumerable people carrying their dinners to their baker's shop. The sight of their poor revelers appeared to interest the spirit very much. He stood with Scrooge beside him, Baker's doorway, taking off the covers as their bearers pass, wiggled insects on their dinners, and his torch, a very uncommon kind of torch, and once or twice, when there were angry words between some reverent donor kind carriers, who adjusted each other, he shed a few drops of water on them from it, the good humour was restored directly, from what they, for they say it was a shame to quarrel upon Christmas Day, so it was good God love it, so it was. Entire the bells ceased and the bakers were shut up, yet there was a single a genial shadowing forth all their dinners, the dinners in progress, their cooking, the forward blotch of wet above each burger's oven, the pavement smoked as if stoves were cooking too. Is there a peculiar favour in which you sprinkle your torch? asked Scrooge. There, my own. Will you apply to any kind of dinner this day, said Scrooge, 
to any kind of given to the poor one most. Why to the poor one most? said oh, Scrooge. Because it's most needs most spirit, said Scrooge. I was a moment's thought. I wonder if you, of all the beings in many worlds, that us should have desired to clamp these people's opportunities in instant enjoyment. I cried the spirit. We deprive them of their means of dining every seventh day, often the only day in which they can be said to dine at all. It's good, wouldn't you? I said, cried the spirit. You seek the true clothes these places on the seventh day, said Scrooge. Comes at the same time. I seek, strange spirit. Forgive me if I am wrong. I've been done in my na- your name, or at least that of your family, said Scrooge. And you are so, some upon the earth of yours, said the spirit, who may claim to know us, who, by the deeds of passion, pride, ill will, hatred, envy, bigotry, selfishness, and our name, are as strange for us and our keith and our king, so they never lived. Remember that. And charge their doings on themselves, not us. Scrooge promised that he would, and went on invisible as they had been before in the suburbs of the town. The remarkable quality of the coast, which Scrooge observed at Baker's, and notwithstanding the joint size, recovered itself at any place with ease. Go beneath a low roof, quite as gracefully, and like a supernatural creature, as it was possible. He would have done in any lofty hole. Perhaps it was a pleasure that good spirit had, had in showing off his power, his, or else it was his own kind, of generous, hearty nature. Sympathy, all his poor men, they straightened Scrooge Clark, and there he went, and took Scrooge with him, holding him to his robe. On the threshold of the door, the spirit smiled, stopped to bless Bob Cratchit's wedding, sprinkling a torch. Think of that. Bob had been put fifty. But fifteen bob a week himself, pocketed on Sundays, and his and fifteen copies of Christian name, and yet the Christmas, Christmas, ghost of Christmas present, blessed his poor ruined house. Then up rose Miss Cratchit, Cratchit's wife, dressed out, out but poorly and twice turned round but brave in ribbons, his cheek made a gaudy show of sixpence. He laid the cloth, says my Beth, 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 Belinda Cratchit. Second of her daughters, also bathing cut, cut ribbon, ribbons. Well, Master Peter Cratchit plunged a fork in the saucepan of potatoes, getting the corners of his munchous shirt collar. Bob's private property conf- conferred upon his son there in honour of the day, and his mouth rejoiced, by himself so gently retired, and yearned to show his linen in the fashion of parts. Now, two smaller Cratchit, boy and girl, came tearing in, screaming outside the baker's. They had smelt the goose and known it was their own, a basking in the blur- luxurious faults of rage and onion. His young Cratchit danced about the table, exalted Master Peter Cratchit to the skies, while he, not proud, although his colours nearly choked him, blew the fire until the slow potatoes bubbling up. Not loudly at the saucepan need to be out there out peeled. What was ever what has ever put your precious father got your precious father in? said Mrs. Fatchit. Your brother Tim Toy Tim and Martha. Wouldn't it be late last Christmas Day? Well, half an hour. Here's Martha, mother, said the girl, peering out as she spoke. Here's Martha's mother, cried the two young Cratchits. Oh well, it's such a boat goose, Martha. Why, oh, bless your heart alive, my dear. How late you are, said Miss Cratchit, kissing her a thousand times, taking off a shawl and bonnet for her with a fish of seal. Oh, it'd be a deal. We had a deal what, to finish up last night, cried the girl. Had a clear away this morning, mother. Well, never mind so long as you are what come. Then Miss Cratchit, sit ye down before the fire, my dear. Have a warm lot now. Lord Christmas. Lord bless you. No, no, there's father coming, cried the two young Tratchits, who were, who were everywhere at once. Hide, Martha, hide. And Martha did hid up myself, and in came little Bob. And father, at least three feet of comfort of exclusive of fringe, hanging down before him, his threadbare clothes darned up and brushed to look seasonable. Tiny Tim upon his shoulder. Lass for Tiny Tim, you bought a little crutch 
and his limbs supported by his own frame. Why, where is your mouth? I cried by Cratchit, looking around. Not coming, said Mrs. Cratchit. Not coming, said Bob. The sudden this this insulation. The spirits for he had been tiny Tom's Tim Bloodhorse all the way from church had come home rampant. Not coming, poor Christmas Day. Marvin did not like to see him disappointed. If it was only a joke, she came out promptly, protrimly, hiding the close sit door, ran into his arms. The two young crutchets hustled. Tied him and bore him off into a wash and might bear the pudding singing in the copper. So he might hear the poet pudding singing in the copper. And how did you like? How did little Tim behave? asked Miss Ratchet when she rallied Bob on his credibility. And Bob hugged his daughter at his heart's content. As good as gold, said Bob. Better. Somehow he not thinks gets out thoughtful sitting by himself so much. Thinks the strangest thing he's ever heard. Tommy coming home, he hoped the people saw him in his church. Because he was a cripple, it might be pleasant for them to remember on Christmas Day. The made lame work beggars walk, a blind men see. Bob's voice was tremendous. Then when he told them this, he trembled more than he said. The tiny Tim was growing strong and heartened. His active little crutch was purred upon the floor, and cut back came tiny Tim before a word spoken, scolded by his daughter, brother, and sister, while he stood before the fire. While Bob turning up his cuffs, said, Paul, fellow, who was capable of being made more shabby, compounded. So a hot mixture of jug and gin and lemons and stirred it around and around, put it on the hob to simmer. And Cratchits went to fetch the goose, which they would soon return in high procession. procession. Such a bustle soon that they might have thought the goose of various old birds of feathered phenomenon, to which a black swan was a matter of course. In truth, something very like it in that house. Miss Cratchit made the gravy ready for forehand and dipped saucepan. Hissy hot, Master Peter mashed the potatoes with incredible vigour. Miss Belinda sweetened up the apple sauce. Martha dusted the hot plates. Bob took Tiny Tim beside them in the tiny corner of the table. Two young Cratchits set chairs with everyone, but forgetting themselves to mount guard upon their posts. Crown spoons did a mouse. At least they should shriek for a goose. Body turn came to be helped. Last of the dishes were set on. Grace was said, succeeded by a breathless pause. Miss Cratchit looking, slowly opening up, slowly all along the carving knife, prepared to plunge in it the best. But as she did, when the long expected gush of stuffing issued forth, one moment like a rose, all above the right world. Even Tiny Tim was slightly by two young Cratchits beat the table to handle his knife and feebly cried, hurrah. It was never such a bird, Bob said. He didn't believe there was ever such a bird who's cooked. Tenderness of flavour, size and cheapness. The themes of the universal admiration. Eat up by apple sauce and mashed potatoes. It's different at dinner for the whole family indeed. As Miss Cratchit said, great delight, serving, laying one small atom of the bone upon the dish. And he hadn't ate at all what we asked. Yet why only each one of them but everyone had enough. The youngest scratches were in particular the steep and stage and only to the eyebrows. And now the plate's been changed. And Miss Belinda, Miss Cratchit, left the room alone, too nervous to bear witness, to take the pudding up and bring it in. Suppose it would not be done enough. Suppose it would break in turning out. Suppose everyone would not get up over the wall to the backyard and stolen it. Or they made Mary marry the ghost. Suppose it were two young Cratchits who became livid. All sort of horrors, I suppose. Hello. Hello, A great deal of steam. The pudding was out from copper. It smelled like a washing day. It was cloth that smelled like the eating house. Pastry cooks next door to each other. I mean, it's dangerous. Labour did. Dangerous. Next door to that, there was pudding in half a minute. Miss Cratchit entered the flush, but smiling proudly with the pudding. A speckled cutting ball, so hard and firm, blazing, half half cotton, lighted grandly, big knit, with Christmas honey stuck in the top. Oh, one thing, pudding, Bob Cratchit said. Call me too, he got it as a great success achieved by Miss Cratchit since the wedding, since the marriage. 
In fact, it said that now the weight was off her mind. She confessed she had no doubts about the quality of her vow. Everyone had said something, had something to say about that. But nobody said or thought it was all it was all, all a small pudding for a large family. It would have been flat, he say, to say that so. A Cratchit would have blushed to hint at such a thing. At least the din was all done. Cloth was cleared and he swept. Fire made up. The pail and the jug being tasted. Skidded perfect apples and oranges were put upon the table. Shovel full of chestnuts on the fire. Then all the Cratchit's family drew round the heath. In what? Bob had called a circle, a meaning half of one. While Cratchit's elbows stood, the family displayed glass. Held home as a burst of cup without a handle. They held the pot stiff, stuff in a jug forever, ever. As well as gold goblets with the dung. Bob stood it out with beaming looks, and while chestnut for fire spurted, crackled noisily, and Bob posed. A merry Christmas to all. That's all, my dears. God bless us. It's all the family echoed. God bless everyone, each, everyone, said Tom Tim, and last of all. He sat very close his father's stride upon his little stool. Bob held his withered little hand at his, as if he loved the child and wished to keep him by his side and dreaded that they might take him from him. Spirit, said Scrooge, interest that you never felt before. Tell me, sighed Tony Shim would live. I see a vacant seat, replied the ghost, in a poor chimney corner, a crutch without an owner. Carefully preserved, their shadows remain not altered. Thy future child would die. No, no, said Scrooge. Oh, no, Kai Spirit. Say you'll be spared. If those burdos remain unaltered by future, none other than by race, turn the ghost, will find him there. But when, what then? If he'd be like to die, he better do it. This grease of surplus population. Scrooge hung his head to hear his own words, quoted by the spirit, he was overcome with penitence and grief. Man, said the ghost, if man be in the heart, not adamant, be able to forbear. Wicked can't, uh, can't, can't, until they, uh, you discovered what the purpose is, where it is. Will you decide what men should live or what men should die? It may be that in the sight of heaven you are more worthless than nude. It's fit to live with. Minions like this poor child, and child, oh God, who hear the insect on leaf pronouncing. To the other, too much life among his hungry brothers in the dust. Cause bent over the screws of ghost book, and trembling cast his eyes upon the ground. He raised him seedily, greedily, on hearing his own name. Mr. Scrooge said, Bob, I give you, Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. A founder of the feast indeed, cried Miss Fat. Catch it, reddening. I wish I had him here. I'll give him a piece of my mind to feast upon. I'll be have a good appetite for it. My dear, said Bob, the child, children, the Christmas Day. It should be Christmas Day, I'm sure, she said. I know which one drinks the elf of what such an ominous, stingy yard and thinny man as Mr. Scrooge. Now he's, he's, he's Robert. Now he knows it better than you do, my dear fellow. My dear, as Bob. Bob's mind answered, Christmas Day. I drink his health for your sake and the days, said Miss Fetchit. Fetchit, but not these. Long life to him, a Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. And be very merry and very happy, I have no doubt. Children drank the toast after him. It was first led to a seed, which was no hotness. Turned children drank at last of all. Didn't care, top of the puppet, so. Doos would over the family, would mention his name, cast a dark shadow in the party, which was not dispelled. For full five minutes. I did pass away the ten times merrier before, for the mere relief of Scrooge, baneful being done with. Bob Cratchit told him how he had a situation in his eye with a book from Master Peter, which would bring, would bring in the attained four, five, and six months weekly. The two young Cratchits laughed tremendously at the idea of Peter's being man of business, and Peter himself looked thoughtful at the fire. From between his colours, if he were deliberating, what particular investments he should favour when he came into the seat of that for a real income. Martha was a poor apprentice at the miller's, then told them what kind of work she had to do, how many hours she worked at the stretch, how she meant to lie in bed tomorrow morning for good long rest. Tomorrow being a holiday, she passed at home. And also, she knew how she had seen a countless. Test and the Lord some days before. 
how the Lord that was not much bad was much about it, it was tall with Peter and which Peter pulled up his collar so high he couldn't have seen his head as if he had been there. All this time the chestnuts of jug went round and round. By the by, they had a song about the dust child travelling snow. Twenty ten was a plaintive had a plaintive little voice, saying it very well indeed. Nothing to high mark in this. There was not a handsome family, they were not well dressed, the clothes the shoes were far from being walkers. Clothes are scanty, Peter might have known, and very likely did, inside of all brokers. They were happy, grateful, pleased with one another, consented at a time when they faded, and looked happier yet in the bright sparklings of spirits that torch. Part of Scrooge had his eye upon, t- upon them, especially on Tiny Tim till the last. By this time it was getting dark and snowing pretty heavily. The Scrooge is bit with long streets of brightness. The adoring kitchens and the f- fires, the kitchen parlors, and all sorts of rooms were wonderful. Here the figure of blaze showed preparedness, cosy dinner, hot plates baking through and through before the fire, deep red curtains ready to be drawn, shut out cold and darkness. Here all the children in the house were running out into the snow to meet their married sisters, brothers, cousins, uncles, aunts, first to greet them. Here again the shadows of the window blind. Or guests assembling in a group of handsome girls, all hooded and fur booted, all chattering at once, tripped lightly off with some near neighbour's house where, well, upon a single man who saw them enter, art for witches, well, they knew it in a glow. But if you judge from their numbers of people on their way to friendly gathering, family gathering, friendly gatherings, you might have thought that no one was at home to give them welcome. When they got there, instead of every house expecting company, pineapple's fires, half shimmy eye, blessings on to it, how it goes exalted, how it bared its brief brief of breast, opened its capacious palm and floated on, outpouring the generous hand of bright harmless mirth on everything within its reach, the very pamphletor who ran on before, dotting the d- dusty street with specks of light, who dressed to spend the evening somewhere, and laughed out loudly as the spirit passed. Though a little kennel, the st- light lamp, light lamp, he had any company but Christmas. Now, without word of warning from the ghosts, he stood upon a bleak desert moor. Where Muncher's masses of rude stone were cast about, though it was a real place of giants, water spread wherever it, uh, itself wherever listed, would have done so, but the frost that held the prison, and grew nothing grew but moss and foes, and were coarse rank grass. Down the western city sun left the street with fiery red, which glared upon the desolate for an instant, like sullen eyes frowning lower, lower, though yet was lost in the thick low, the darkest night. What place is this? asked Scrooge. Place where millers live, who labour in the bowels of the earth. Returned the spirit. Do they, they know you? They know me. See, a light shone from the window of a hut. Swiftly advanced towards it, passing through the wall of mud and stone. Found a cheerful company assembled round a glowing fire. An old old man, woman, their children, their children's children. No duration be done. All decked out gaily with their holiday attire. Tiny old men in voice that swelled and rose, by the howling wind upon the warm waste, was singing them a Christmas song. It was a very old song, but a, uh, a boy from a time, the time when he all joined in the chorus. So surely as they raised their voices, the old man got quite blithe and sound. So surely they stopped his vigour of state again. The spirit did not tarry with their hand. A bad scrooge Hold his robe and passing on to the moor, bed with her, not to see, to see the Scrooge fire. Looking back, he saw the blast of the land, frightful age of rocks behind him. His ears were deafened by thundering of water, so it rolled and roared and ravaged among the fearful cabins. And he had worn and fiercely tried, tried to undermine the earth. Built upon a dismal reef of sunken rocks, a league or so from shore on which the waters chiefed and dashed the wild year through. There stood a solid lighthouse, great heaps of seaweed clung to its base of storm birds, 
born of wind, wind one might suppose a seaweed of water rose and fell about it like the waves they skimmed but even there two men who watched the lamp and made a fire and threw the loophole the thick stone wall tread out a ray of brightness on the author on the author sea joining their horny hands the rough table at which they sat they wished each other christmas in a can of grog and one of them the older to his face all glowing to scarred they have their hard weather the figurehead of the old ship might be struck by a steady song that was like a girl itself Gander's bed was sped on by the black and heaving sea on and on until being far away he told screws from only shore he lighted on the ship he stood beside the hillman at the wheel looked out the bow the figures officers had to watch dark ghostly figures in their several stations every man among them hummed a christmas tune or had a christmas fault spoke below his breath to his companion a bygone christmas day with homeward hopes belonging to it every man on board waking or sleeping good or bad had had a kind word for another on a day when any other day of the year had shared some extent of facilities and remembered those he cared for a distance and had known that they delighted to remember him it was a great surprise to scrooge while listening to the moaning the wind and thinking of that solemn thing it was move on through the lonely darkness over to an unknown abyss his depths were the secrets of a profound and death it was a great surprise to scrooge was well, this engaged to hear the hearty laugh a much greater surprise to Scrooge to recognise it, his own nephews, the finest of bright, dim, dry, gleaming room, bits standing smiling by the side, looking at the same nephew, approving of felibility. Ha ha, oh, Scrooge's nephew, ha oh, ha ha, should happen by any unlikely chance to know a man's the best in the laugh in the Scrooge's nephew. All I can say it is I should like to know him to introduce him to me. I cultivate his acquaintance. It is fair, even even handed, noble adjustment of things that while there is injection, fetching the deeds and sorrow, there is nothing in the world so universally contagious as laughter and good humour. Scrooge's nephew laughed it in his way. Holding his eyes, rolling his head, twisting the face in the most extravagant convulsion. Scrooge's niece, my marriage, laughed at as heartily as he knew. My assaulted friends, being not a bit behind, roared like dusty. Ha ha ha! He said that Christmas is humbug, as he always lived. It's cried Scrooge's nephew. He believed it too. Oh, shame for him, Fred, said Scrooge's niece, indignantly. Bless those women who never do anything by halves. They are always in earnest. She was very pretty, seemingly pretty, and with a dimpled, surprised looking capital face, right little mouth that seemed made to be kissed. No doubt it was all kinds of good little dots about the chin, imagined to one another as she laughed at the pair of her eyes. No sort of little creatures heard. No, she was what you would like to have called provoking. You know, but satisfactory too. Oh, perfectly satisfactory. He's a comically old fellow. The Scrooge's nephew. That's the truth, but not so pleasant. He might be, however, his offences carrying his own punishment. I have nothing to say against him. I'm sure he's very rich, Fred, hinted Scrooge's nephew. At least you always tell me so. All of that, my dear, said Scrooge's nephew. His wealth is no use to him. He doesn't do no, no any good with it. He doesn't make himself comfortable with it. He hasn't the satisfaction of thinking, ha ha, that he's ever doing to benefit us with it. I have no patience with him. Observed Scrooge's niece. Scrooge's niece's sister, all the other ladies expressed the same opinion. Oh, I have, said Scrooge's nephew. I'm sorry for him. I couldn't be angry with him if I tried. He said, My who suffers with all the ill winds. He himself always. He takes into his eyes to dislike us. He won't come and dine with us. Well, as a consequence, he doesn't lose much for the dinner. Indeed, I think he does. A very good dinner, interrupted Scrooge's niece. Everyone else said the same. It might be allowed to have been compliment judges, because they had just had dinner, and the dessert upon the table were clustered, and the fire by lamplight. Well, I'm very glad to hear it, said Scrooge's nephew, because I 
great faith in those those young housekeepers. What do you say, Topper? Topper's clearly got his eye upon one of Scrooge's nieces now. This is so he answered what a bachelor was wretched outcast, who had no right to express an opinion on the subject. Where it says Scrooge needs the plump one, the lace lap tucker, not the one with toes is blush. Do it go do go on, Fred, says Scrooge's niece, clapping on her hands. He never finishes what he begins to say. He's such a ridiculous fellow. Bruno's nephew revelled, and others laugh. It was a puzzle to keep the infection off. For oh, the plump sister tried hard to do it with amaragic vinegar, he says uncles and sadness he followed. I'm going to say, said Scrooge's nephew, what Cockroach have his taking of a dislike of us. I'll make him merry with us, and I think he loses some pleasant moments, which will come do him no harm. I'm sure he loses pleasant opinions. He can find his own faults. He never in his mouldy old office or his dusty chambers. I mean to give him the same chance next year, whether he likes it or not. For I pity him. He sure he may rail on Christmas until he dies. He can't help thinking better of it. I defy him. You find me getting going there. He got to me year after year and gave him saying, Unscrewed, how are you? But he puts him in the vein to leave his poor clerk fifty pounds at something. Oh, I think I shook him yesterday. So they turn along now. The notion of she's shaking Scrooge. But being good natured and not much caring what they laughed at. They laughed at any rate, encouraged them in merriment and passed the bottle joyously. After tea, they had some. They had some music. So they had a, were a musical family. They knew they were about. They sang a glee or catch. It was surely Betty Topper who would growl away. The bass, like a good one, and never swell the large veins of his forehead. Get red in the face of the screw over it. But when these played well upon the harp. Played among other tunes, a simple little air. Mere nothing. You might learn to whistle in two minutes. Which he'd been familiar to a child who fetched Scrooge from shop. Body school had been reminded by this ghost of Christmas past. The strain of music sounded. All the things that ghosts had shown him came on his mind. He suffered more and more. A thought he would listen to it often years ago. He might have civilized cultivated the close of life and happiness of his own with his own hands that resulted to sex and blade. A buried Jacob Palmer. They didn't devote the whole evening to Scrooge. But while they played the foot fits, it was good for your children sometimes. Never better than at Christmas in Mighty Thunder. Was a child himself. Stop. at the first game at, at Blind Man's Buff. Of course, there, there was. No one more, more believed Topper was more rather blind. I believe he had eyes and boots. My opinion is that he was done things between him. The screws nephew that the ghost of Christmas present knew it. The way he went about with the plum sister, the lady of Tucker, outraged the credulity of human nature. Knocking down the iron pie irons, tumbling over the chairs, bumping against the piano, smothering himself among the curtains, wherever she went, well, there he was. He always knew where the plump sister was. He couldn't catch him anyone else. If they had fallen up against him, as some of them did, he proposed he would have felt faint. And to deceive you, which would have been an affront to her understanding. And instantly had settled off the direction of plump sister. She often cried out, it wasn't fair. She really was it really was not. But at least it caught her. And when in spite of all the rush silken rustlings, her rapid flutterings had passed him. He got her in the corner of the there was no escape. Conduct was most streetable. Pretending not to know her, pretending that it was a necessary to touch her headdress. And further to show himself to identify how the pressing curtain with a certain ring upon a finger, a certain chain upon a neck, was vile, monstrous, and after he had told him an opinion of it. Then, rather by men being in the coffice, there were so many confidential, very confidential together on the curtains. Guru's niece was not one of the blind men, but a made comfortable with a large chair and footstool. No corner with ghosts and screws were close behind her. But she joined in the forfeits and love to her uh, admiration with all the letters of the alphabet. Likewise, the game of how, when, and where. She was very great, and to the secret joy of Scrooge's nephew, beat her sister hollow, for though they, they were sharp girls too, Tubber 
would have told you. I might have been twenty people there, young and old, but they all played so did Scrooge, wholly forgetting an interest that he in was and what was going on, his voice made no sound his ears. He sometimes came out with guests quite loud. Very often guests quite right too. So I believe the best most most white trouble guarantee not cut in the way, not sharper than Scrooge. Blunt as he took it in his head to be. The ghost was greatly pleased to find him. He was in this mood. He looked upon him with such favour. He begged like a boy to be allowed to stay till the guest departed. But his spirit said, could not be done. Here is the new game, said Scrooge. One half hour of spirit, only one. It was a game called Yes or No, but Scrooge's nephew had to think of something of his moment to find what. He was only answering to their questions, yes or no, in the case, as the case was. Bruce for a question in which he was supposed to say the least, least single thing from him. He was thinking of an animal, large animal, rather discreet of animal, savage animal. Out of the ground, granted, something to talk, something to talk sometimes, and lived in London, walked about the streets, wasn't a show, show of it. I wouldn't lead by the lead anyway. He didn't live in the immediate country. I didn't I never killed a mountain. And it was not a horse or ass or bone or bull, cow or bull or a tiger or a dog or pig or a cat or a bear. A big question was put to him. And if a burst in the rest of the laughter. So especially tickled. He was obliged to set all his subjects on for a stamp. Last pump sister pulling out a similar state. Well out. I found it out. I know what it is, Fred. I know what it is. What is it? cried Fred. Your it's your Uncle Scrooge. Which is certainly then he was. Admiration was so universal sentiment. No, though some objected, Clyde is a, is a bear. Thought it'd been yes. In much an answer, negative was significant to have diverted. Thoughts of Mr. Scrooge. Supposing they had ever had any tendency that way. He has given us plenty of merriment, I am sure, said Fred. It would be a good grateful but to drink to his elf. Here is a glass of modern wine, ready to my hand at the moment, and I say, Uncle Scrooge. Well, Uncle Scrooge, they cried. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to an old man, there he is. Scrooge, nephew, you wouldn't take it from me, but I may have it nevertheless, Uncle Scrooge. And Scrooge, and perpetually becomes so gay and light of heart. He would not have pledged that unconscious company return. Paint him an audible speech. Ghosts had given him time. The whole scene passed up with a breath of the the last words showed his bugger my nephew. He and his bit were again upon their troubles. Much they saw and went there he went far they went. More homes they visited, but always with a happy end. The spirits stood beside sick beds and they all were cheerful. Foreign lands they were all close at home but struggling men. They were patient and agreed to hope. By poverty he was rich. In Elm's house, hospital and jail, and misery every refuge, where a vain man in his little brief authority. Not made fast the door, bowed the spirit out. He left his blessing and taught Scrooge his precepts. A long night, it's only a night, but Scrooge had his doubts. For this, and because the Christmas holidays appeared to be condensed, base of time, he passed together. Strange too that while Scrooge remained unaltered, his outward form grows, grew older, not clearly older. Scrooge observed this change, but never spoke of it, until the last of children's twelfth night party. When they look at the spirit, they stood together in an open place, and as his hair was grey. My spirit's life so short of Scrooge, my life has slowly been very brief of Scrooge Ghost. It ends tonight, tonight, so Scrooge, Scrooge. Night and midnight hark, the time is drawing near. Chimes are ringing three quarters past eleven. At that moment, forgive me. If I am justified in what I ask, said Scrooge. Looking intently at the spirit's robe, I see something strange but not belonging to myself. Trudy from your foot skirts. Is it a foot or a claw? It might be a claw for the flesh there is upon it, said the spirit's full for reply. Look here. The folding his robe, it brought two children wrenched, abject, frightful, hideously miserable, and knelt down its feet and clung upon the outside of its garment. Oh man, look here. Look down here, exclaimed the ghost. A boy and girl, yellow merry, merry, merge, 
mage, ragged, scowly, wolfish, perspiratory, too, in their humidity. But oh, graceful youth should have feel their features out, touch their freshest tints, stale and shriveled hand like that of age and pinched and twisted them, pulled them in shreds. Where angels might have been thrown and devils lurked and glared out menacingly. No change, no degradation, no perversion of humanity, any grade. Through all the mysteries of wonderful creation, has monsters half so horrible and dread. Scrooge started back applauded. Having been them shown the way to him, he tried to say they were fine children. Words choked itself rather than the parties lie of such enormous magnitude. Bit of yours, Scrooge said. Say no more. Our man's, said the looking down upon them. They have come to me, peering from their fathers. This boy's ignorance, this girl is want. Where were them both? They all had agree they must of all beware this boy. For his despair I see written, which is doom. This is ribbing is, is eased. Tonight, said the spirit, stretching out his hand towards the city. Land and those who told it to you. Made it from your fictitious purposes. Make it worse and buy the time. Do you have you no know, refuge of resource? Cried Scrooge. There are no prisons, said Spirit, turning on him. Last time of his own words. Are there no workhouses? The dog bell struck twelve. Scrooge looked out about him as a ghost and saw it not. As the star stroke ceased to vibrate. He remembered the prediction of old Joy from Marley. The dummy eye beheld a sullen phantom. Draped and hooded, coming into mist along the ground towards him. 